Let's get started. Um, I hope you all had a nice weekend. And so today we'll start the last week of the T10 talks. And today, Matthew McEwer, a master student here at RLI, will tell us about intrinsically motivated GBF agents. Yeah, so uh, thank you everyone for coming to my tea time talk. Just to give a brief outline, I'm going to be covering sort of the TMACE environment and environment we're using to explore this area. Uh, I'll also just give over a high, high level overview of what GBFs are and what is intrinsic motivation. And then I'll talk briefly about why these two ideas, uh, I think, complement each other, and then some recent results. I'd like to just start off saying uh, thanks to Benafshe, who is another student here that I've been working with a lot, and then also my supervisor, Adam White. So I think to start this tea time talk, we can start off with a motivating problem. So imagine you just have this episodic tabular MDP with four terminating states. And uh, there's four signals of interest. So when your agent moves from this cell into the distractor, it gets a uh, mean zero variance one random value. When it moves into this fixed um, cell, then it just sees a value of one. When it moves into this other fixed cell, it just sees a value of one. And the drifter is a target that um, sort of just gets a, it's a random walk process that just gets mean zero variance 0.1 uh, added at the end termination of every episode. So given this fairly simple MDP, uh, we just have the high level goal of maintain an accurate value estimate for all four signals. So while I was describing this problem, uh, some of you may have been uh, thinking that this sounds like a GVFs, and this is exactly where GVFs fit in. So um, when I said maintain an accurate value estimate all four signals, just to elaborate, that meant I want to have a value estimate leading up to the distractor for all these states. I want to have a value estimate for the fixed, a value estimate for the drifter for all these states, and a value estimate for the other fixed for all these states. And GVFs are a way to do this. They extend the idea of a normal value function, um, in a few ways. So instead of having a reward, you just have this cumulant or signal. So in this tabular MDP, you have uh, the four cumulants, you have these four signals of interest. Uh, notably, they also uh, change from having sort of a discount factor that you associate with the MDP. Each GVF, generalized value function, has a pseudo termination function. And this just allows you to express sort of more complex ideas with these value. Uh, value functions. And then uh, the last thing to note when you're going from a normal value function to a general value functions is you can be conditioned on different policies. So if I'm trying to come up with a value function for the distractor value, it sort of it makes sense that that policy that would be conditioned on would be different from the value function going to the drifter. So in this problem, the each uh, of the four GVFs um, each, each four would be conditioned on a different policy. So to elaborate a little bit more on GVFs in the setup, uh, this collection of sort of the value function, the policy, and the pseudo termination, that sort of mini learning agent, you can, we just call it like a daemon, and we just have one daemon per four um, uh, of these signals. Uh, the pseudo termination is just constant, since it's episodic, it's zero when it reaches one of these terminating states and the agent gets teleported back to the start. And lastly, the prediction demons are just conditioned. Their policy is just the greedy path to their respective uh, cumulant signal. So just the greedy path to this fix, the greedy path to distractor, the drifter, cumulant, uh, drifter demon is just greedy path to the drifter, etc. cetera. So, um, uh, in this low-level example, you may be wondering, like, why are GVFs useful? And um, these are some of the ideas that I find compelling. GVF research is really in its infancy, so uh, there's still a lot uh, of work to sort of bear out that these are uh, real benefits. But I think at Alberta, the general consensus uh, is that a lot of people think that these are um, exciting opportunities with GVFs. So, by having uh, many value functions, you can sort of give a more rich feedback for to improve representation. Uh, hopefully, you can transfer knowledge from task to task a little bit better because the GBF can be task independent. And then there's some fun research recently uh, that's been on sort of you can do option synthesis in the chemo space. 
uh, some potential long-term benefits uh, that like I see is sort of further away, but very exciting is there's like successor representation. And then I think most people probably will have heard uh, Rich talk about a super Dyna architecture. So uh, like, you know, GVS play a very important role in there. Um, and then of course you want to be able to learn them efficiently. So when I describe the problem, going back to this teammates, if you noticed, I set a high level goal of we want to maintain an accurate value estimate for all four GVFs, but um, I didn't actually specify the reward function. So you can think about this problem. What should the reward function be to allow us to have uh, a nice accurate value estimates? So like, should we have a reward, maybe plus one for reaching each of the four terminating states? Or maybe uh, then you may think that, oh, well, Drifter, that's a more important to visit because it will be a random walk process. It's harder to, you can always visit it more to get a more accurate estimate. Um, maybe we should have a high reward for going to the Drifter. But all of those are task uh, dependent reward functions. So if I change the MDP slightly, you, you, you may need to change your reward function. And this is where intrinsic motivation comes in. So in the standard view of RL, you have your actions, they go into your environment, and you get your next states and you get the rewards. And this reward is very much dependent on the task. It's, there's a single task and you, you're getting this reward. And if you change the task that wants to be done, then you have a different uh, reward function and things don't transfer over uh, very well usually. Intrinsic motivation addresses this problem by saying, okay, you still have your large agent and it outputs actions and it gets sensations. But these sensations, it's up for the agent internally to have its own reward function to associate the rewards with these actions. And this internal reward function should not be dependent on the external reward. It should be a general principle reward function that given almost any kind of task is still uh, generally beneficial to have and it encourages good behavior. And that sounds like a very uh, big goal, very broad goal, and uh, it is. It's it's hard, um, but like I, I think we can sort of see in biology this sort of an example of a case where it's somewhat working. And uh, when you read the intrinsic motivation literature, uh, at least to me, it sort of feels like there's three main categories that you come across. There's uh, for this general reward. There's the prediction error. Um, so if you have a model of the environment, the intrinsic reward of using some form of prediction error basically says, oh, you may have a mistake in your model. It'd probably be good to go to that area more time so you can learn a better model. Uh, so give a high reward for if you find high prediction error. Uh, then another intrinsic reward that you often see is novelty or surprise. And this is saying, oh, if you had a large change from your prior to posterior belief, then this means this was really beneficial for you to go to and you should go to it more often, high intrinsic reward. The last one that you sometimes see is state visitation counts. And this is the general, general idea that states that you've been to less often, probably you could learn more from. So just encourage uh, visitation to less seen states. And then also in the intrinsic motivation literature, you sometimes get this uh, where the agent is only maximizing the intrinsic reward. And then commonly you also see uh, the agent maximizing the extrinsic reward, so the task-dependent reward, with some weighting of this intrinsic reward. And sort of the intrinsic reward is supposed to complement the extrinsic reward. So intrinsic motivation and GVS are both hard. And uh, they um, are hard for different reasons, but I think uh, they complement each other. So intrinsic motivation, I think, is hard because it's really, to me at least, it's not entirely clear what is desired, like, should it be the case that this intrinsic reward works on its own or is it fine that it sort of works in tandem with an extrinsic reward? It's also tricky about how to really evaluate intrinsic motivation performance. And it's not, uh, like it's just, it seems, that entire area seems sort of unclear to me what's the, sort of the best route to make. Um, similarly, or not similarly, but GVS are exciting, but a lot of the exciting use cases for GVS require learning many GVFs. And learning many GVFs uh, can be hard, sort of if you just think about it, um, it, it it's uh, sort of it's not clear how you would learn many of them. 
So that's why sort of intrinsic motivation and GVF seem like a really good combination because they sort of help each other in their respective weak spots. Uh, intrinsic motivation gives us a way to um, quantify a task independent reward function to help us sort of learn GVS efficiently. And then GVS gives us a more concrete way to evaluate and understand what is desired for an intrinsic motivation system. So uh, going back to when I started this tea time talk, I said like the high level goal is to have uh, an accurate value estimate for um, all four signals. Well, um, now we can start getting a little bit more specific. So we want an intrinsic reward function such that the behavior that maximizes this intrinsic reward gives the lowest value error averaged over all demons. So let's look at this uh, nice simple test bed example again and think about what are the intrinsic rewards that we'd expect? Like what would be good intrinsic rewards? So um, like let's first think about the fixed. So the fixed is a just you know a constant value, uh, an intrinsic reward. Well, it may be high initially. We'd expect it to uh, sort of decay very quickly because this intrinsic reward is supposed to encourage uh, behavior to maintain accurate value estimates. And since the fixed is a constant value, uh, you would very quickly uh, get a pretty accurate estimate, and it wouldn't be changing. So you'd expect it to decay very quickly for the fixed. Similarly, for the distractor. It's a noise, um, mean zero, variance one. So it may be a little bit harder to realize it's just noise. But again, once you have a mean estimate, you really don't get a better estimate by continuously visiting the distractor. The only one that you sort of benefit by continuously visiting is the drifter, because the drifter is just sort of this random walk process that's constantly being modified. So you can always sort of get a better, accurate, more accurate estimate by visiting the drifter. So that comes down to, so now we discussed what are the high level sort of, what do we expect from these a good intrinsic reward? So now it comes to actually uh, ascertaining like how good the intrinsic reward is. And initially, um, and sort of the end goal is we'd want to just plug in these intrinsic rewards into our agent, see the behavior and just evaluate the value error and that's done and that's sort of the end goal. Um, but there's a couple little, uh, intricacies that sort of make it a little bit more opaque. Even in a tabular MDP, you kind of have the exploration problem. So how does the agent find the goals? And then uh, you also have to deal with the fact that uh, these intrinsic rewards are highly non-stationary. So as I was discussing what we expect from these rewards, I was using words like decay and discourage. So maybe you didn't initially think of it, but these, intrin these intrinsic rewards, it's very much the case that you get a very different reward the first time you go to fixed than the hundredth time you go to fixed. So they're highly non-stationary. And then just in general, we want to be able to analyze the behavior. So uh, when you have the agent that can control its own behavior, it just gets a little bit more difficult to understand. So then that comes down to the second way you can also evaluate how good the intrinsic rewards are. And that's by just using a common sense fixed behavior policy, and then just see like what are the intrinsic rewards that you're getting? Do they match what our sort of uh, expectation is for a reasonable reward? So when we're going to fix the behavior policy, we'll first look at an example of that. Um, the fixed behavior policy will just be the target policies for each demon. So it's just going to be a round robin of I go up and I go to the fixed, I go up, I go to the distractor, get teleported back, I go up to the drifter, get teleported back, fixed, teleported back, and then just repeat. And this is just called round robin, and it's, it, that just seems like a fairly reasonable um, behavior policy, and we can just sort of see what are the intrinsic rewards that we are getting. Now comes to uh, some recent results. So uh, in a study uh, and a paper analyzing the bandit setting, um, they found that the weight change could be a fairly effective uh, reward. And so now we've been trying it in the MDP setting. And weight change uh, in RL often is some function of sort of the step size, the error, and the eligibility trace. And what's really nice about using weight change is that we've sort of offloaded a lot of the work into the step size adaptation method. So when I was describing that TMAs, um, especially for the distractor, the noise signal, I kind of was saying that 
the intrinsic reward should decay over time because the agent should learn that, oh, this is just noise. And that it's non-trivial to realize that something is noise. And step size adaptation people have put a lot of work into um, sort of uh, identifying if a signal is learnable or not. So by using weight change, we can harness uh, a lot of that work that's already been done. So here's an example with the controlled behavior with round robin. And this is the intrinsic rewards on the x-axis is just steps. And as you can see from this, uh, the red line is the distractor intrinsic reward. So the component of the intrinsic reward that's coming from uh, the distractor daemon, the weight change in the distractor daemon. And uh, the other uh, blue line is the weight change from the drifter daemon. And then the yellow and green line, these ones, are just coming from the fixed. And as you can see, initially, the intrinsic reward component coming from the distractor is very high because it has always this big spread, it's constantly changing. But over time, actually, this value, uh, the intrinsic reward component decreases, and it goes below the drifter, and actually tends to zero. And that's because the step size adaptation method is partly kicking in and really cranking down the step size for that uh, demon. Uh, while the drifter, which is something that we said we expect to sort of constantly be getting a bit of intrinsic reward, since you can always be improving yourself on your estimate, uh, it sort of tends to give a fairly consistent uh, non-zero reward, which is really nice. So this is promising behavior. And uh, I should have mentioned, sorry, I forgot, but the step size adaptation method this graph is using is auto. So auto is sort of a successor, uh, just something uh, built on top of IDVID. And the off policy learner for the demons was just a uh, normal tree backup. And when I was talking about step size adaptation, this is just one of them. But it also lets us keep up to date with whatever is sort of most popular in the literature. So here we can actually see that this seems to work fairly well for many different kinds of step size adaptation methods. So auto, this is the one that we were talking about. But you can also see for Tidbid, um, Ada Gain, AMS Grad, and Adam, all of these different step size adaptation methods, you sort of see the same pattern of initially the distractor is high, but then the step size kicks in, it goes low. High, goes low. And here you can just sort of see the average step size for the demons. Um, for various ones, sort of the distractor gets cranked down while the drifter remains a bit higher. So this is really promising. This is what we wanted from our intrinsic reward function. And uh, yeah, so this is what we wanted from our intrinsic reward function. And uh, now you may sort of think, OK, let's go back to what if we just try plugging and playing, let an agent learn from this intrinsic reward. Um, we mentioned those caveats about it being highly non-stationary, and it may be a little bit more difficult. But let's just see how an agent does. So using a simple expected SARSA behavior that's being fueled by these intrinsic rewards, um, let's look at uh, how it does. So this first graph is just showing uh, the probability of visiting each of the respective goals. And the uh, y-axis is just the probability, x-axis is the episodes. And what this is saying, this was ran over many trials. And it's saying, like, on the 100th trial, what uh, proportion of runs finished, uh, terminated at each of the four possible uh, terminations, drifter, distractor, fixed. And as you can see here, um, initially, you know, it starts off fairly equally for all of them. And the fixed targets drop off very quickly. So it becomes pretty rare to go to e either of the fixed targets fairly quickly. Uh, the distractor initially has sort of high chance, but then it too drifts, uh, drops off uh, fairly quickly. And then uh, the drifter sort of gets more and more popular, and that sort of becomes quite consistently the uh, chosen uh, goal to go to, and the agent sort of continuously visits it. So uh, comparing the two between sort of the learned behavior and then the controlled behavior, uh, just sort of plotting out the error, the weight change, and the step size, um, you can see they sort of uh, they perform fairly uh, uh, fairly similar. Uh, you can uh, the weight change for both of them, the drifter goes up quite a lot, the step size gets cranked up. Uh, for the learned, while it remains fairly flat, low for the distractor. 
uh, I would say take these results with a grain of salt. I haven't done uh, sort of a very uh, large parameter sweep to see how they, which ones, uh, sorry, which ones the best to get sort of a more uh, quantitative answer. This was this is currently not exactly what I'm focusing right now with my research, uh, but I just thought these were fun results to show for the talk. So in summary, uh, intrinsic motivation is the way for the agent to uh, efficiently learn many GVFs. And similarly, efficient GVF learning, if that's the goal, helps pin down what we want for intrinsic motivation. TMAs is a setting to help understand this uh, interaction between intrinsic motivation and GPFs. And then I just, I really like it. A simple concept like weight change with step size can seem to perform pretty well. And it's sort of, uh, it's elegant. I like it. So uh, that's my talk. Um, feel free, uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. I have just a clarification question. Yeah. You kept saying the intrinsic reward was the weight change. Yeah. But maybe you meant the absolute value of the weight change. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I guess uh, that could have used an equation writing. Yes, uh, 100%. I mean, uh, the absolute value of the weight change summed across the demons. OK, thank you. Yeah. I have a question too, Matthew. Um, nice talk, thank you very much. And good comparisons across multiple methods. So one thing that came up as you were presenting the presenting the um, goal for the behavior was that, I mean, right now it seems like you're going to be very sensitive to scale. I'm sure that's something you've already thought about, but I mean, if you have um, different, different predictors with widely different scales of operation, um, different set points or different variances, uh, your, your objective or the policy that you're trying to find might be might be founded on on very shaky ground. Do you have any thoughts on how you, or have you already thought about how you're going to make this potentially scale invariant? Like, let's say your your drifter was drifting over a very wide range, and and your other rewards were like fixed rewards were at different scales or set points. Um, have you, have, do you have any insight on that? So um, I guess I haven't run um, any sort of uh, serious experiments to try to answer that question. I think it's really interesting. I've sort of thought in my armchair a bit about it. And I, I guess I didn't think it was too, if I understand it correctly, you're sort of saying, what happens if the distractor has a much larger variance or like a fixed value has mean uh, a thousandth or something. And so there'd have to be significantly a large, uh, uh, like a uh, weight change. Is, is that what you're sort of asking? Like, yeah, I just I remember what maybe I misunderstood as well when you were presenting the presenting what you were hoping for with the policy. But you're saying you want a if I'm paraphrasing, tell me if I'm totally messing this up, that you were hoping for a a policy which will will minimize or increase the essentially will increase the, the reliability of your estimates or minimize the error on your on your various different things that you're hoping to learn the different the different forecasts. Yeah. Um, and so one of them, like the baseline error might be really, really high. If you have something that varies and even has a little bit of jitter, but it's got a gigantic scale, you might be seeing big errors or small errors. So it, it seems like that, that, that scale and, and offset is actually a really big problem based on, on that desire to minimize the, minimize the error, given that you might be talking about widely varying signals. But maybe, maybe you're going to say that's fine because, hey, these are all rewards and the rewards within certain scales. And so we're OK with that. Or, or is there... Um, I guess uh, part of my thinking is uh, uh, just so we want to be able to maintain an accurate estimate and perhaps uh, like those scales, it's part of like if those scales are inherent to the environment, they're a little bit inherent to the environment. Um, and then uh, like with step size adaptation, we sort of get the step size, the step size can also crank up fairly high. So. Uh, sort of at least sort of w what I um, have been thinking is just that uh, for whatever respective uh, demon that's learning it, uh, it may be a very high error initially, but after a certain time period and with step size adaptation, hopefully it wouldn't be too long, uh, the, you would sort of get approximately near the solution and then sort of the jitter becomes important. So uh, uh, when you're maintaining, a, maintaining this value estimate, uh, you may, maybe there's some complaints in the very short term about maybe uh, sort of 
it's an unreasonable expectation, but as the agent progresses, not quite in an online setting, but as the agent progresses, you sort of hope that you would, for whatever scale it's operating at, it would start to narrow in on the, the mean. I, I guess that's how I um, would have thought about it, but. Cool, thanks, good answer. That, I really appreciate that, that helps. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Hey, Matt, I got another clarification. It was a good, a good talk. I love this. But uh, I was I still not exactly sure what the GVF is. Um, yeah, you've got the four corners, and those are like mm -hmm. recognized states. They're all recognized as different states, like A, B, C, D. Yeah, I'll just uh, move to there. And... Um, So what was the cumulant for, say, the distractor, let's call that state A? Mm -hmm. So uh, the cumulant is uh, for when you reach this state, uh, when you transition to that state A, then uh, it's just a random variable mean zero variance one. And for all other transition states, it's just zero. So the cumulant signal is zero, 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 all the way up here until you transition into state A, the distractor state. And uh, this would just give out a signal of mean zero variance one. But that that is the same signal that is, uh, say, fixed if you, end, if you end up in the state, one of the lower states. Isn't that the same well, signal? Um, yeah, so I guess this is a little bit of a, a uh, funky thing. This is an epi so episodic may actually be that now I, I realize who I'm talking to. Episodic may be slightly the wrong word to it. It's a sort of a non-stationary episodic. So every time uh, the agent is going through this, it reaches let's say the state A. It sees a, a value um, let's say 0.5 mean zero variance one. Gets teleported back to the start when it goes up and. Uh, oh, wait, I have a question about that, because is it correct to say that it receives a reward? Um, well, uh, no, I wouldn't say it's receiving a reward. It's just a cumulant signal. It's not so much that, uh, at, at, at this case, it's just trying to maintain, it's doing the prediction task. It's not trying to do any maximization. So th is it true that the fixed signal and the distractor signal are totally different signals. It's not just that one has, has, is, is random and one is fixed, it's that they're totally different signals. Yeah, so there, there's four totally different signals and the agent would be seeing sort of this uh, four vector, uh, four element vector of cumulant signals when it transitions to every state. And when it transitions from every state, it would always be all zeros except for when it transitions to the distractor, the corresponding element in this sort of cumulant signals vector, that corresponding element would just be this distractor distribution, a sample from it. Uh, when it transitions into this fixed state, uh, sort of that element would always just be equal to one since it's a fixed constant. Uh, and, if it, and if you went into the other fixed state, it'd be a different signal that was always constant. Uh, so in the end, it's uh, I think it's uh, fairly um, invariant to this, but uh, the, in the experiments I've done, it's just I've used the same fixed constant value. It's just been a fixed constant value of one. Yeah, but it's a different signal. Yes, it's a different signal. A uh, completely different signal. Uh, yeah, so maybe I should have color coded these differently. So uh, they're, they're, these two are different signals. And uh, the discount rate for all of these is just a, a constant, uh, not zero, uh, uh, not one value. What's the policies? Yeah, so uh, the policies for this is for um, each demon, it's conditioned on the greedy path to sort of their respective terminating state. So uh, you have one demon sort of monitoring the distractor cumulant, and it's just a greedy path starting from start to the distractor. 
then you have like the, the drifter demon and that's just a greedy path uh, to the drifter. And similarly um, to, the, to each of the respective fixed. So uh, they're all conditioned on a different um, target policy. And the question is, is there a behavior policy that we can learn that would allow us to sort of have a good value estimate for each of these GBFs? There's a question in the chat. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Uh, there must be something, but can you please comment on the difference between cumulant signal and reward? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So I guess the way uh, I, I think of it is it's uh, they're actually sort of very similar in some ways. It, it's just uh, the reward, often we think of it as it's this, there's this one signal for the MDP. It's reflecting on how we're doing on a task, and that's what we care about. That's like all we care about in RL. And uh, the cumulant is just a general abstraction saying in an MDP, we can have just many different signals and we just want to have a good, like we just want to have a value function that estimates the discounted sum of uh, returns, uh, discounted sum of uh, the cumulant signal. So if you were talking about reward, you may think, uh, okay, a discount rate, which is uh, an even, averaging of the next five time steps and zero any time after. If you're talking about rewards, that'd be a really weird discount rate to have for a reward function. Like, shouldn't I care about it sort of going out to infinity or some sort of normal discount rate? It would be odd to see something that's, I only care about the next five states and then just zero always. But for uh, cumulant signals, um, that's, that's a little bit more of a sensible uh, re, uh, discount rate. And that's why it's often called pseudo termination function, because you can have, it may make sense for different signals, just different things your agent is seeing, it may make sense to have different uh, discount rates. Um, I, I guess that's how I uh, think of it. I hope that, uh, hope that clarifies it. Yeah, there's another question in the chat. And you mentioned non-stationary nature of the intrinsic reward. Is the non-stationary a problem, or doesn't it doesn't matter to the learner? So that's a that's a really good question. Um, so if you notice with this, especially with this drifter, um, this drifter is making this tabular MTP non-stationary. Uh, when the agent goes, it will be very much a different value each time it transitions from this, and that value is deterministic. It's not like um, this is sort of a stationary distribution of mean zero variance one. Um, I don't think of it as too much an issue for the GVFs. This is just, in my mind, a, a simple way to model uh, something that you can continuously be improving upon. Um, and it's not like uh, uh, this inherently has to be uh, sort of a plus one random walk process. You could imagine you could have a similar signal that's perhaps uh, zero for 10 visits, and then one for 10 visits. Zero for 10 visits, and then one for 10 visits. You could sort of imagine any kind of uh, non-stationary signal that it's just, it's an easy way to represent something that you can continuously be learning. There's another non-stationarity, and maybe this is what you were referring to, um, in the, uh, I guess I address it here, uh, with uh, the intrinsic rewards, for guiding the behavior policy, um, that's uh, another set of intrinsic. Uh, that's another uh, case where there'd be a non-stationary reward. So instead, so um, and that's reward for the agent. And since we'd be modifying, it's in the control setting. I think that makes uh, some algorithms may have a little bit more. It makes it a little bit more complicated for evaluating how good the intrinsic reward is when it's non-stationary, because non-stationary is just gets a little bit harder for control. But it was nice with the expected SARSA, we could sort of see uh, already desirable behavior emerging. Any other questions?
Well, I'm just going to follow up on that question about on-station rewards then. Do you think there's anything that we're going to have to do algorithmically to make our behavior policies better? Or do you, are you imagining that we can, you know, take our standard algorithms, they have constant step sizes, let's say, or their step sizes are always changing, so they can sort of track as the rewards change? Or do you think we're going to have to rethink our algorithms? Like, we're going to need a new expected star set for learning multiple predictions, or we're going to need a new policy gradient method. So um, one of the things I, so my, my hope is, uh, so yeah, I guess there's two different areas you could think that we, that we may potentially need algorithmic uh, development. There's sort of for the GVFs, uh, this is heavily reliant on um, sort of off policy learning, like the behavior policy uh, could, get, could look really funky and quite incoherent. And depending on your off policy uh, method, you could have important sampling ratios that um, sort of get very, very large because uh, you, you could imagine uh, with intrinsic rewards, you could get a lot of weird uh, wandering in, in sort of the cells. Uh, so I think the off policy learning, that, that's a, an area where uh, sort of that would make big gains for um, algorithmic improvement. I, I don't have any strong ideas currently on how to <laughs> go about improving off policy uh, learning of that. And I don't see why having many, currently I haven't thought of uh, why a, if you're learning multiple GVFs that would affect the off policy problem because you still, even if you have a hundred GVFs, you want to have your one GVF learn off policy correctly. That's still just a one-to-one -one sort of uh, relationship between that GVF and the behavior policy that's being employed. So um, I'm, I'm not sure how how you could improve uh, that. And then as far as uh, behavior policies being powered by uh, this non-stationary reward, um, I guess uh, to me, it's just, we have to wait and see and see how uh, tough it is uh, for a normal expected SARSA or some policy gradient method to work with non-stationarity. I think that's something uh, I need to read more about, but sort of my rough understanding is kind of the case that a lot of, a lot, we often choose problems that are non-stationary since they're sort of nice for a lot of reasons. And when there is non-stationary, non-stationary, we kind of sweep it a little bit under the rug and things seem to work fairly okay when you have that. So hopefully uh, normal algorithms will work, but I'll have to wait and see for that. Yeah, something sort of fun about this is uh, it translates uh, by mapping everything to this intrinsic reward. It sort of uh, brings you back into the reward hypothesis, where uh, sort of all goals can be expressed as like a single or single scalar reward. And it's nice because this is bringing it back to that where we can leverage our existing knowledge. Uh, there's sort of a different way you can go with this, which is um, multi-objective RL. And uh, that where you have to sort of consider like Pareto optimal strategies, which means like you can maximize on one, but uh, Pareto optimal means like you can do the best in one of your objectives, but then uh, you can't do any better on the others. And that sort of, that's a whole other field that uh, is, looks uh, like there's a lot of challenges. All right, if there are no more questions, let's all thank Matt for the talk. <laughs>